You know, as I read this, I think it didn't really have to be just a testimony of Alma, even with Amulek. Every one of those individuals could have had the witness of the Spirit. When a prophet speaks, there's always a second witness, the witness of the Holy Ghost, if you're willing to seek, to search for it. And that witness, if you deny it, is even uh, carries heavier consequences than you deny the witness of, of another man. Uh, God always fulfills the laws of witnesses. But they aren't able to access the Holy Ghost, or not willing to, and so God leaves them without excuse and sends another witness in, in Amulek. As you think about the message and, and what happens here in chapter five or chapter uh, chapter nine and ten, what what particular things do you like to point out? Well, one thing I I particularly like about the chapter is we we see a people who who really wants a, a physical evidence. They want to twist the words. They're they're and and we are all here scholars of religion, but they want to take a very you know physical view of the text does it is it coherent is what amulek said coherent can we twist it this way like you said there's there's a resistance to allow yourself to feel anything it didn't really matter if there was one witness or 58 witnesses it could have been any number it's just that doesn't make sense i can't let myself feel anything and so to me it stands out as a people almost beyond feeling you know just uh, i won't allow myself to be touched because there's inconsistencies in your story. And it's not only just a, a, a tacit um, effort to resist. This is, we're not going to just resist, we're going to go after you. You know, they bring in the lawyers, they, they do what they can to, to truly um, challenge these testimonies and, and to thwart the work of these um, missionaries. Yeah, that, that's, it's interesting. If they didn't believe Alma, they could have just ignored him. Yeah. But it's not enough just to ignore. They have to attack. They have to attack. And they should just... It's, it's kind of like when one of my children come and say, Dad, he called me stupid. And I always say, well, are you? And they say, no. And I say, well, then don't believe him. <laughs> <laughs> and it's done. But they can't do that. They want, they want to revile back. They want to... Yeah. Well, um, I think chapter 9 is a good place to... Uh, to teach um, the principle that if you have access to the covenants, you're held to a higher standard. You see that, for example, in verse 23. Uh, Alma says to him in chapter 9, verse 23, Behold, I say unto you that if this people, who have received so many blessings from the hand of the Lord, should transgress, contrary to the light and knowledge which they do have, I say unto you that if this be the case, that if they should fall into transgression, it would be far more tolerable for the Lamanites than for them. Yeah. They certainly have that taught. Was it DNC section 82 and elsewhere in the scriptures that where more is given, more is required of the Lord because he's blessed you with light and knowledge and opportunities. So, good point. It's <clears throat> careful to note that that was part of the angelic discussion that they had had. That was not just Alma's feelings, but he says, now behold, this is the voice of the angel. Yeah. So, yeah, this is, uh, you know, a divine reminder. You know, we see a parallel, too, between chapter 5 and what we see going on here, that he, he goes back and initially there's some historical, do you remember, have you mm -hmm. forgotten, uh, you know, verses, what is it, um, 7 and 8, uh, 8 and 9, behold, you wicked and perverse generation, have you forgotten the tradition of your fathers, and, and please remember this, and so you see this, uh, in fact, he recounts a lot of the history of the Nephites, trying to bring them back into that standard that they ought to be living, um, and yet they're very different than the people of Zarahemla. Yeah, the approach doesn't work quite as well with them, does it? In fact, they just taunt him. In chapter 9, I love the way, again, as Mormons are bridging this, he, he throws in little notes for the reader. For example, in verse 2, where they say, we won't believe you even if you say the earth should pass away. And then Mormon in verse 3 says, now they understood not the words which they spoke, for they knew not the earth should pass away. And then they say, we wouldn't believe you if you say the city should be destroyed in one day, in verse 4. And then Mormon interjects, now they understood, they knew not that... Uh, that uh, God could do such marvelous works. And later on we see the city destroyed in one day. In one so, day. That's right. It's almost as if they had pronounced their, their own, own doom as they did that. Uh, I love the way that he teaches about the Savior as he closes out this first part of his discussion in chapter 10 and, and um, letting him know that, that Christ should come, or excuse me, chapter 9, in verse, for example, in verse 26. Then he's finished and Amulek steps forward and bears his testimony. What's the, what's, the, what's the central part of Amulek's message, if you were, if you had to summarize it? Well, I think
think first he starts off that he is called of God. You know, he gives the reason that he's there is because he knows. And uh, certainly any missionary going out to bear testimony, and I think it's especially important for him uh, as he's sharing testimony among his own people, how he's come to know that truth. And in a sense, he's saying, you can discover this for yourselves. That's a great example, huh? Yeah, a large part of what he says is to say, there's more than one witness, mm -hmm. and I, I am this other witness, and he gives you his history. I was with you, but I had felt the Spirit before, I, but I just hadn't fully come aboard. Yeah, that's verse 6, which mm -hmm. David mentioned earlier, but uh, it's so good. Maybe we should, it's all right if we read that. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, I did harden my heart, for I was called many times, and I would not hear. Reminds me of uh, the Lord's statement uh, to Paul in Acts 9. That isn't it hard to be kicking against the pricks here? Uh, how many times are you going to do this before it, you let it have its proper influence on you? It had some influence. Verse 12 says that the people began to be astonished. And you think at verse three, 13 would say, and they repented in sackcloth and ashes. But instead, but. it says that they began to question with their cunning devices and, and brought in their, their hired guns. Um, you know, I think when lawyers read this, they get nervous. Um, maybe they ask, is it I? Thank goodness there are good lawyers. But this group didn't necessarily fit in that category. Not yet, but they will eventually. And the chief among them, of course, is Zeezrom, and, and he begins to, to, to question him as well. Uh, verse 17, again, Mormon makes this point as they are trying to trap Amulek with his language. Mormon makes a point now they knew not that Amulek could know of their designs. I, I think he's just really enjoying this translating and knowing what he knows, looking back and seeing all the devices and, and, and what's happening there. Verses 22 and 23 have always interested me. He says in 22, I say unto you that if it were not for the prayers of the righteous who are in, now in the land, you would have already been destroyed. Sometimes when we read this, we think every one of them is just miserably wicked, but apparently that's not the case. The righteous are definitely a minority, it seems like. But the Lord says there, and, and again in the beginning of verse 23, it's by the prayers of the righteous that you are spared. Now if you cast them out, then it's going to be too bad for you. Um, so one, it's an interesting insight into the situation, but two, it's an interesting reminder, I think, of the power of our prayers, wherever we are, whatever situation we're in. Uh, the Lord will often uh, spare a larger group immediate destruction and provide an opportunity for repentance if there's at least some faithful leavening agent, some faithful group of saints that are willing to pray and ask for mercy and ask for, for more time to preach and, and to you know exemplify the gospel and teach the gospel. So, some salt. Yeah. Well, that's, that's part of the forewarning, too, because they will cast out those that right. are righteous. Yeah. We do see their destruction yeah. as a consequence of yeah. that. So we see a prelude here. Well, Zezrum gets pretty specific and tries to entrap him. Um, what do you think of Zezrum? I, I think he's the epitome of, of the Ammoniah Heights, if that's how we say that word. They, <laughs> you know, they, he, he wants to prove Alma and Amulek wrong by logic. So if his logic can show a hole in their thinking, then they're wrong. And uh, the thing that's so remarkable is that he, he, that logical person, converts. And I know it, when I look at this chapter, there's a lot of interesting history here. But for me, uh, you know, a personal lesson is, here's a man who's obsessed with logic. I usually assume that person is beyond reach. But here's a person who somehow in this story came away touched. He, he felt something eventually. And, and that, that has great hope for people in fa my family or in, you know, people I've met that I think, oh, they're beyond feeling. Well, even Zezrum, who's pretty hard-hearted, is not beyond feeling here.